Dr. Nuremberg's Mind Body Workout System. My beautiful brothers and sisters, thank you once again for being here. Uh, you're the source of the inspiration for doing this, those in the room, those watching the DVD, and those listening to the CD. So I'm honored. It's a privilege to be able to share this time with you and these ideas. The topic today is how to harness the hidden power of failure. I'm going to be using two books during the course of the talk. One is The Cause of All Failure, and the other is Success is How We Deal with Failure. But I'm going to start off with the bottom line about the hidden power. I'm not going to have you wait. I'm going to tell you right off what it is. Failure motivates. Failure educates. Now, of course, this is all in the context of the proper motivation because there are people who can be destroyed by it. But when somebody has a warrior mindset, which is, I will gain power from hardship, I will gain power from failure, I will gain power from uncertainty. These power thoughts, which we're going to go more into, the power thoughts which allows us to arise and, and deal with ourselves and deal with life. And I'm going to go more into the power thought system and, and deal with it in such a way as to make this come true where failure does motivate and failure does educate. That is the hidden power of failure. Society can admire the greatest successes in all areas, but if we examine the lives of these people, the day-to-day -day experiences are those of failure. The day-to-day -day experience, there's some point where somebody can say, well, I've been successful at getting my degree. I've been successful uh, at becoming married. I've been successful at getting my first million dollars. But the day-to-day -day experience is often filled with frustrations, chaos, setbacks. So if we examine the life of everybody, we see that the day-to-day -day experience is often that of failure, but there's an attitude, the warrior mindset, and the law of tribulation to gain power from that, to not be stopped by it, perseverance. To the extent that we're persevering and they just they have setbacks and we just move forward. No one is satisfied. All fall, sh all fall short of doing what they believe they can do and of being what they want to be. Somebody who's a millionaire, my thought maybe thinks he could be a billionaire. Somebody who's bench pressing uh, 405 pounds might think he should be bench pressing 450 pounds. So there's always a sense of, uh, I, I could be more. And in that sense, there is uh, something of a failure experience alongside with celebrating the successes that we have. Uh, no one feels they exercise enough. All fall short. Almost no one has enough money to support the lifestyle they want. I'm going into these just to talk a little bit about the sense of failure that permeates uh, many people's lives. People don't eat the way they think they should. Most people think, gee, I ate too many carbs today or I ate too much. Uh, that's a common experience. I, you know, I'm trying to lose weight, I'm trying to get in shape, or I'm not getting enough protein. I'm not getting enough protein to build my muscles up. So the, the, the constant sense that people have that you're just not doing it. Of course, the goal is to be content with where we, we with our experience now and our achievements now, and yet strive. But there is a sense also of just not being enough of whatever we value. No one is relaxed enough. Deep down, all know they are not as peaceful as they seem. You look at most people, and I think, well, gee, they're peaceful, but they feel they could be more peaceful. Of course, the good news is this is, this is not a negative. These are not negative statements. These are just to point out uh, the day-to-day -day experience. These are all positive statements because it's going to lead to good. No one is sufficiently authentic. Uh, most people will go into something uh, where they're forcing themselves to be friendlier than they feel or more up than they feel or whatever, so that even though they may have values of authenticity. So again, there's a failure in that sense. But uh, the good news is we're going to keep moving in a positive direction with this. These are all failures felt minute by minute, day by day, year by year, and the good news is they're going to educate us and motivate us. I'm going to keep pointing out the good news with it, otherwise it could, be, it could seem pretty negative. This is not negativism. This is reality. This is not negativism. In fact, Stating this is highly constructive in assisting us to be at peace with imperfection. Because we are imperfect, therefore we're not accomplishing everything on a day-to-day -day basis, month-to-month, -month, year to year basis, to be at peace with that while we still move forward. 
On a day-to-day -day basis, who does not fail at being a son, a daughter, a parent, a spouse? Everyone feels they could be doing more. And the good news is we're going to be using that in a constructive way. Whose marriage is all it could be? Who does not hide the darkness within? Who is truly spiritual enough? Which true believer does not run from death? Is it so that we must fail at what matters most? Is every direction the path of the wrong way? Within this wrongness, may we not find even for a moment the splendid jewel of ourselves. Again, as good news is, we're going to move in a positive direction with this. Failure motivates. Failure educates. Uh, so when I talk about these setbacks and failures as shortcomings, uh, it's not bad news. It's good news. It's just talking about it so we can then see, well, where do we go from here? Such defeat, the source of, the source of humility, manifests in many ways. Many of the great spiritual leaders had terrible marriages. Uh, that's, that's a fact. Uh, so they might be great in some area and not in others, but they failed in some areas. We know them for the greatness. So the fact that we have our shortcomings and our imperfections and our failures also does not subtract from the greatness of who we are, from the magnificence of our own identity, from the nobility of our identity, and from the great conquests and victories that we do have. It doesn't detract. It stands side by side. Whose words of goodness truly match their deeds? Who, have, who has learned all they want? Who is not more worried about their petty concerns than about the suffering of humankind? So whoever aspires to great spiritual depths probably uh, gets more upset when the car doesn't start than the hungry children starving in other nations. So we fail even at reacting the way we aspire to react. But even with this, I still hold out the tremendous dignity of the human spirit, the nobility of the spirit, and how we become motivated and educated through all these failures. But we have to also deal with reality. Who is not selfish? Who is not self-centered? Who has enough compassion? We all fall short of this. Certainly I do. Every, all of us do. And again, it doesn't detract from the potential within ourselves and from the enormously constructive direction in which we are going. Have we all not been trapped within the prison of ourselves since time began, trapped in ourselves with our own self-absorption while there's much going around us that needs to be attended to or, the, or be so absorbed in ourselves that we don't see the love and beauty around us? Who truly appreciates and is sufficiently thankful for the enormous love and beauty in which we are immersed. It's easy to lose that perspective and get totally defined by a moment of negativity. That's a universal failure, and that's going to help motivate us and educate us. As we mature, we can become proud of our failures. They have strengthened us and made us what we are. So we're not just talking about uh, that failure motivates and failure educates. You say, well, you, you talk to people who have been successful, they, they talk about their failures and their certain lightheartedness about it. But also we can talk about our failures before then. Uh, most of us at some point want to hide our failures or there's a shame to it or embarrassment. Success is to persevere, to rise up over and over, to be tolerant but to strive. So success is how we deal with those failures. So we say, I'm going to learn from this. I'll become motivated by this. When in doubt as to whether you can succeed, there are two approaches. One is to affirm, I can do it, I can do it. But then we need, or some, for some people, we need what's called a shield penetrator, one of the 21 factors in the mind-body workout system. A person might say, I'm just trying to psych myself up until I can do it. Heck, I know I can't do it. It could make the person more negative. So they need what I call a shield penetrator. Even if I have uncertainties in reality, I can do it and I will do it. Even if I have uncertainties in reality, I can do it and I will do it. Now, in the Dr. Nimberg mind-body workout system, we also use exercise with it. Even if I have my uncertainties in reality, I can do it and I will do it. Even if I have uncertainties in reality, I can do it and I will do it. Even if I have uncertainties, I can do it and I will do it. And I'm closing my eyes. I'm focusing on my words. The other is a paradoxical approach. The other is to say, I cannot do it. I cannot do it. Until a doubt is noticed. And that doubt is the doorway to self-confidence. I cannot do it. I cannot do it. Wait a minute. What am I saying? Heck, I can do it. 
So it flushes out the doubt, and the doubt then is the pathway to positiveness. Those are the two approaches. Now, uh, as part of this uh, journey, I will share uh, specific failures, uh, the failures I'm most familiar with, which are my own. So I'll, I'll, I'll share those failures, and, and if I can think of or remember other people's failures, I'll share those, but I'm less intimately knowledgeable of those. Uh, all right. So you look at uh, some of the early failures uh, that I can remember. Uh, I, I, I wanted to go to Harvard. Uh, I didn't get in. Uh, th this didn't happen. Uh, or Princeton and, and Dartmouth. I, I got to the University of Buffalo, which was not that difficult to get into, to be honest with you. So, uh, and then, uh, uh, then, then, I, then I went to University of Buffalo. I became very depressed after two years. Well, you can say that a failure. I couldn't even continue on emotionally. I was so depressed. But my, that depression, which was fairly debilitating, uh, I learned a lot. Uh, I went on a, a, an antidepressant called Melorol. That thing had me just drowsy, so I went off of it. But one of the things that I realized is that I said, I never want to get depressed like this again. And so that's part of the reason I'm here as a psychologist. I wanted to help other people. It motivated me to want to help other people with their depression and their issues because I went through it. And I, one, I didn't want to go through it again, and two, uh, I want to help other people when they're there because I would feel compassion. And I remember when I went to different psychiatrists and psychologists, I didn't get any help. I mean, they just were so aloof and distant. Well, I, I'm opposite to that in my office. I'm very interactive and listening, but also advising and giving methods. So even the methods that I have was a reaction to what happened to me then. The motivation then, I, I didn't want to get depressed like that ever again. And I wanted to be able to help others with it. And I've done that. So. Even the course of my life was affected by the fact that I moved from one school that was an okay school to another school that was maybe even a little less prestigious, Hofstra University. But that depression uh, had a tremendous effect. Now, and, and I haven't been depressed since. I've had anxiety since or nervousness or stress, but I've never been depressed since that time. Uh, that's been an amazing thing, which I'm very thankful for. You know, interestingly enough, one of my daughters, Janara, uh, is doing her graduate work at Harvard. So I wear a Harvard uh, sweatshirt, and I say, you know, I couldn't get into Harvard. My daughter did. So uh, I take extra pride in that. And I don't just say my daughter went to Harvard. I said, I couldn't get into Harvard. I tried as an undergraduate, and I tried twice as a graduate student. I couldn't get in. So it, but my daughter got in there, and I take more pride in her getting in there because I didn't get in two times. So it turned into a, a positive thing. Now, uh, I did, okay, so there's something that looks like it's negative, turns out positive. Well, I did get into Columbia in graduate school, which is a very prestigious school. So that sounds really good on the resume. What I was given was called a terminal master's degree. Now, let me tell you what a terminal master's degree is. That meant I took an oral, I took a written exam, I did very well, and then it's an oral exam, which is a very political situation. One of the professors, Howard Hunt, who was a very famous researcher in personality work, I found out later from somebody from the committee that he spoke negatively against me, and they gave me what's called a terminal master's. I called up Professor Hunt, and I said, gee, what happened, you know, in that? He said, well, since you called him, I'm asking to be very, very honest with you. He said, uh, your answers, you, number one, we don't think you're Columbia PhD material. And number two, uh, your answers were elliptical. He said, do you know what I mean by elliptical? Well, I don't know if anybody would know what he meant by elliptical. He says, well, he said, you seem to know what you're talking about, but you don't. Wow. <laughs> I had nightmares about it for years about wanting to, to, you only got one shot at those exams back then. It was very political. So what happened was I took a year and went and I studied electronics technology because I was interested in the field of electropsychology. Uh, then I got to University of Texas, had to take all the classes over again. They didn't count anything for my whole two years at Columbia University. But once I passed the core program, they did count it, and I got my PhD in three years uh, of being at the University of Texas. I took a trip back to Columbia, and guys I started with hadn't finished up their PhD. The average time at Columbia was 10 years. So I had my PhD before people I started with, with the failure. So here again, the perseverance 
And keep in mind, I was traumatized, and that's the word. I would have dreams that they would let me take that exam again. And by the way, interestingly enough, like 30 years later, I went back to campus again, and I asked about Howard Hunt. You know, like, where is he, you know? They said, who? So here he was, a man well-known at that time, and no one even rem remembers him. Of course, he made quite a, an impression on me. He's, he's the guy who basically got me out of Columbia at the time. So here's again, I'm sharing the setback on uh, what took place because I'm pointing out the, by perseverance, uh, at the time I didn't have the power thought system, but I was so hungry for that knowledge. Uh, then when I was at the University of Texas, when I came to my last year or so, a you know, year and a half, I was basically a hippie at the time, and I realized that this knowledge that I was learning I no longer regarded as sacred. And uh, they weren't going to kick me out of the program because I was doing what was called sensitivity groups. And so the chairman of the department, Dr. Spence, a very famous psychologist, uh, was, had gotten a letter. And so I dealt with that. In fact, the chairman of my dissertation committee said hire an attorney. I didn't do that. I wrote a letter, and I got through, through it. And uh, the day I had my final orals of oral dissertation defense, I had an argument with my girlfriend, one took my orals, went back and finished the argument with her at the time. So the, the whole path, uh, so I almost didn't get through even the PhD because I didn't go along with some of the policy. There were, there were failures before that in terms of high school, not being inducted into the uh, honor society, uh, lost many high school wrestling matches, all of which, uh, because I, I used to feel more uh, concerned about pinning somebody, humiliating, humiliating another man. I'd, I'd rather be humiliated than humiliated, so my psyche worked against me, so I, I, I would lose. Um, was part of the psychology what took place. Well. Today, uh, part of my, one of my areas of expertise is sports psychology. I would know how to deal with that now in terms of power thoughts uh, and the mind-body workout system. So even my failures as an athlete in high school, which were more psychological defeats than physical because of the, the attitudes I had. Then um, when I went, uh, for my PhD, when I went for my PhD, uh, when I had the PhD, I was in I was in this state, and you had to take exams to get licensed here. So you have again written exam and oral exam. Written exam did really well. They failed me on the orals. I don't know why they failed me on the orals. <laughs> Six months later, I'm back again. Failed me on the orals again. I don't know why. So I've come back six months later again, and I thought this is going to be a ritual. I, I saw 10 years going by, and I said, well, here's Nuremberg. Get out the coffee and donuts. I just saw this going on six months ad infinitum. Well, for some reason, they passed me, so I didn't know why they failed me. I didn't know why they passed me on, on the oral exam. <laughs> but I think they sensed that I wasn't their type of psychologist, and anybody who, who watches what I do with my patients will see. I mean, I'm pushing the envelope, so it turns out I'm not, I wasn't their type of psychologist. I mean, I'm ethical. I'm moral but I definitely wasn't their type of psychologist. But it didn't stop me uh, because, and here's an, a key factor in terms of uh, dealing with failure, is the passion. I had an enormous passion uh, for psychology, for understanding human nature. It was an enormous passion. So that's one of the factors that could take us through all setbacks is a, if we have enough passion for what we want to do. To go to uh, uh, a marriage uh, to my ex-wife, where we were married about 15 years, we had four children, the marriage failed. Well, that, that was what I, but it, I did learn, and it did motivate me. I learned what, it, what I'd want in my, my next wife. I knew I was going to want somebody, if you give an inch, she'd give a mile, as opposed to someone, if you give an inch, they take a mile. So I learned that. Uh, I also... May, I was also motivated in this way that I didn't want to co-create somebody else's suffering because my, I did participate in co-creating suffering in my ex-wife. I said, when I marry again, I would not want to co-create suffering in another human being. So uh, it motivated me to be much kinder uh, and to take more responsibility for what I do in a, in a relationship. So there, a failure uh, led to my ed more education in a relationship and more motivation. 
Then uh, let me give you an example before the mind body workout system. I remember with the ex-wife one day, I was really angry at her. And she came to the door, and I was walking to the door. And at that time, I was trying to lead a really spiritual life. So I was telling myself I'm going to react with compassion uh, and understanding. I'm walking to the door to answer. I know she's at the door. I'm really ticked at her about something. I don't remember what. And as soon as I opened the door, I began yelling <laughs> without hesitation. So in terms of failure, there it was, the failure. But all these things motivated me to say, you know, uh, the truths I know that could set me free, I, I'm not able to live them. And so that, and then I saw even in practice with my patients, I see people make tremendous progress. Then I see two, three weeks later, a month later, they regress back to how they were. They didn't have anything they can carry with them. Well, with the mind-body workout system, I would give them a thought so that even when they no longer remember me, they can keep that thought going and repeating it all day long, every five minutes the first day, twice an hour thereafter. And then I uh, developed a whole technology of 21 factors to help us internalize it, such as the shield penetrator, uh, such as consolidators. Uh, a consolidator would be, I can do it, that's the power thought, and I'm grateful. An amplifier would be, I can do it, and I'm very grateful, very is an amplifier. So I developed the whole technology of, at this point, 21 factors, and that list keeps growing because of my own personal failures that I had, of which I've shared with you, and because of what I saw happening in my practice. You have to really want your power thought to be real. Um, and there's nothing like failure, and with a lot of failures comes pain. Well, pain motivates us. As a matter of fact, I want to tell you one of the greatest motivators for the advancement of all society. It has to do with failure and the fear of failure. Those are very powerful factors to motivate people. They don't want to fail. There's a, a concern of failure or even a fear of it, and that motivates people tremendously in all areas of life. They, they want the success. You know, many people want success, but even more than success, they don't want to fail. For many people, it's an ego thing. I don't want to be seen as failing. So the, that's, again, some of the hidden power of failure in terms of the motivation factor is really not wanting to fail, which is different than wanting to succeed. Now, very often in life, I'm going to give a power thought that's very essential. When I was given a terminal master's at Columbia, I didn't know where I was going. I mean, I had applications out. By the way, I was turned down to Harvard again. And at that point, I replied to Harvard and some other Ivy League schools. But it was uncertainty. In many areas of life, uh, there are uncertainties. When you invest in stocks and bonds, you open up a business, you're getting involved in a relationship. There's always uncertainty, a very powerful power thought. And it's a variation of the law of tribulation. I gain power from uncertainty, and I'm very grateful. I gain power from uncertainty, and I'm very grateful. So moving my arms now as I exercise, I do it, get the proprioceptive environment. I gain power from uncertainty, and I'm very grateful. I gain power from uncertainty, and I'm very grateful. I gain power from uncertainty, and I'm very grateful. Now I'm going to amp it up more. I gain great power from uncertainty, and I'm extremely grateful. I gain great power from uncertainty, and I'm extremely grateful. I gain great power from uncertainty, and I'm extremely grateful. I gain great power from uncertainty, and I'm extremely grateful. I'm closing my eyes. I'm actually listening to myself say that. Now, that power thought's absolutely essential because that's a very common type of hardship, a very common struggle, a very common uh, tribulation is just being uncertain. <coughs> uh, when I was diagnosed a year ago with prostate cancer, uh, it was uncertain how I'm going to deal with it. So uh, the power thought, I will gain power from this uncertainty. Instead, I, I didn't have that power thought in place at the time. I, I took the power thought, I will gain power intellectually, spiritually, and emotionally from this tribulation. I will gain power intellectually, spiritually, and emotionally from this prostate <coughs> cancer. I will gain power intellectually, spiritually, and emotionally from this prostate cancer. And I did. At that time, I became the strongest man in the world and for my age and weight. And uh, it also was very jubilant during the whole aspect. <coughs> I was joking around with the doctors, and you know, it was like a spiritual pilgrimage. I was very up. And the power thought, the mind-body workout was very uplifting uh, in, my, in my accomplishing that. 
And since that time, I've set many world records, both in the bench press and the T-bar strongman pull. At one point uh, in business, I owned a, a business that uh, uh, I, I, I sold for over a million dollars, Baby Photographers of America. And, uh, but, but there was an audit going on, and so the government wanted like 700000 for the IRS. Well, I ended up with an offer in compromise, paid them 100000 but the state wanted 70,000, 10% of the original estimate, and I didn't have it at that point. And this was years later. This audit went on for 10 years. Well, I wrote them a letter saying, if you don't accept my offer and compromise, I sent the state $20,000. I sent the state $20,000. said, IRS took an offer and compromise, and here's a comparable amount. <laughs> but if you don't take this, you're gonna, I'm going to go into bankruptcy. So they sent me back my $20,000, and I bankrupted. Well, ruined my credit for 10 years, but, but I did save $50,000 50, in credit card expenses, which I didn't want to do to the credit card companies, but, but that was one of the positive things to come out of it. <clears throat> also, at the time when I sold my business for over a million dollars, I made a mistake. I bought the wrong lab. I failed to get the right lab. I, I, I used to farm out the lab work. I bought my own lab. I spent $10,000 on one consultant. It was the wrong lab. Well, when I was bought out from Americana Portraits, it made a nice package because we were doing seven, 800 sittings a week. We had our own finance company, framing company, and a lab. So the overall package looked good, so it helped in the sale of the business, even though they eventually had a, they sold that lab out because it wasn't helping them. So it, did, it led to positive things. So there's another aspect to the failures. Very often, not only does failure motivate and failure educate, but very often in failure, uh, the old expression, one door closing is another door opening, and often what looks like a failure uh, is not. And it reminds me of the old uh, Chinese story about the Chinese farmer, uh, who they were very they dependent on his son to help him with the crops and the farming, and his son broke his leg, and the neighbors would come over and say, gee, that's a shame that your son broke his leg, and now you don't have help with the farm. And he says, well, maybe. So what do you mean maybe? He's not going to be there to help you right now because of his broken leg. So well, maybe. Well, within a few years, war broke out, and all their sons were drafted into the Army, off fighting. They were left without their sons. And they came over to him, and they said, well, you're so lucky. Your son broke his leg. It healed. He's helping you now, and our sons are gone off to war. You're really lucky he broke his leg. <laughs> and they said, well, maybe. And the story kept going back and forth like that. So that's another aspect, of course, of something that's regarded as a failure uh, sometimes turned out to be one of the greatest blessings. So uh, that attitude towards failure, that it could end up being a great blessing, uh, is, is an important aspect, an important hidden power within failure. We're talking about how failure motivates, failure educates, but also we're talking about uh, failure may, what seems to be a failure setback may be the greatest thing. Even financial failure could be a great thing for some people because some people could be ruined by a lot of money. Certainly we see all the time with celebrities who become rich and you know, go bizarre because they weren't mature enough to handle it. So uh, there's the possibility, uh, so within this failure, there could be great jewels of benefit. Could be great ben there's great benefit within this setback. There is great benefit within this setback. There's great benefit within this failure. I will find great benefit within this failure. I will become motivated. I'm getting, I will learn from this setback. I will learn from this failure. I will learn from this failure. I am motivated by this failure. There will be great benefits from this failure. These are power thoughts uh, that will lead to a tremendous progress through failure, the hidden power of failure. Now, going back uh, over uh, the, the experience, I have never met you personally, but I know a great deal about you. For one, I know your life is filled with failures, and if you're honest, you know it too. You repeatedly failed for, to the happiness for which you craved. You have failed to make as much money as you wanted. Well, we've gone over some of these. It certainly applies to me. That's all good news. Your biggest failure has been your failure to know yourself. You speak loudly, but in reality, you are only a whisper. And when I say you, I'm talking about myself as well. You speak loudly, but in reality, you are only a whisper. You have failed to take sufficient responsibility for every aspect of your life. Now, that's a very important part of uh, success, is to take responsibility. 
because to the extent this is one of the aspects of dealing with failure. One thing that we should all learn when we about life is keeping our word uh, and and taking responsibility. These are two important parts of overcoming failure and moving more towards success. When a person says, "I'm I'm responsible. I co-created this issue," whether it's in a, a relationship or a business or in sports, I'm, I have responsibility within this. And by the way, just for the record. I fight taking responsibility for the things that go wrong in my life. It's not natural for me. Uh, I, I want to say I'm, it's all related to you. No, so I have to have the power of thought. I gladly take full responsibility for the mistakes I create. I gladly take full responsibility for how I co-create failures in my life. I gladly take full responsibility <laughs> for the failures that I have. And I say gladly because I don't want to just do it reluctantly. Now, I need that power of thought, and I know you do too. Now, taking responsibility doesn't mean feeling guilty or ashamed, you know, beating ourselves down. No, I take that responsibility because I want to grow from it and I want to correct it in the future. What is the worst feeling you can have when you think you have failed? It is a desire to hide your failure, failure that makes the failure even worse. Let me tell you, for a long time uh, after, after that situation at at Columbia, uh, I didn't want to tell people I had a terminal master's degree, or, or I didn't want to tell people that I had, I had uh, been turned down from the licensing board, you know, several occasions. Uh, I didn't want to say those things. You don't want to answer no. You fear people will think less of you. You are embarrassed by failure, maybe even ashamed. You think that to acknowledge failure will make you a failure. Nonsense. Acknowledging the failure, you don't have to advertise it as I am right now, but. Uh, the failure itself makes us what we are and can move us in a very constructive direction, motivate us. I remember my father saying, who became very successful, never graduated high school and became a multimillionaire. And I used to say, gee, Dad, aren't you upset that this guy did this to you and so forth? And he said, son, I've been screwed over so many times, I can't even remember them all. But remember this, son. He said, every one of these people helped put me where I am today. And that was a very successful man. So... You are a human being, and as all human beings, you are not perfect. No mortal one is perfect. It's okay to make mistakes. It really is. So once that's another attitude about failure. We don't want to fail, but it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to fail. It's okay to have setbacks. Uh, and if it's not okay, once a person says, I don't want to you know, ever fail, I don't want to ever make mistakes, then people become hesitant to try anything new. They, be, they just live in a very restricted world that they know they can handle and never venture out. So when a person says, you know, I'm willing to fail because I can come up behind my pharaohs and clean them up. Now, I learned that lesson from a man named Buck uh, who never had an eighth grade education and all the rest of us were graduate students living in a commune back in my hippie days in, 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 near Austin, Texas, in Round Rock, Texas. And we'd all be talking intellectually about how we're going to create the fields and plants things and build things together. We were talking about that, and Buck would be out there while we're talking about doing it, planting the stuff and fixing the cars and doing all that stuff. And uh, screwing up about half of what we did, just make a mess of it. But then the next day, he'd come back in and straighten it up. Well, this, I have a, an eternal debt to this man, Buck, a uh, retired drug dealer who lived out in a commune. Uh, I think he was retired. <laughs> I don't know, but he, 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 was, he was a character. He said he never really thought in words, he thought in images, but he went out there and did things, screwed up half of what he did. And, of course, that was like 35, 37 years ago. Myself, I haven't touched any drugs since that time, although I did then. But here's, here's the point. I learned from him, and, and I've been willing to jump into things ever since uh, and make mistakes, and uh, it, it was very liberating. It's okay to have those setbacks, to have, make mistakes, but I don't let it stop me. And that's an important attitude to have. It's okay to make mistakes. Many people need that power thought. I, at this point in my life, I don't need it, but it's okay to make mistakes. I'll be okay. It's okay to make mistakes. I'll be okay. It's okay to make mistakes. I'll be okay. It's all right if I make mistakes. I'll be okay. Now, if you talk to people who are very successful, ask them if they're embarrassed by their mistakes, the answer will be no. The mistakes make them who they are today. Most multimillionaires have gone bankrupt two times.
When you look back on your failures, you'll come to a point where they make you laugh. Yes, you'll actually laugh. They'll tickle you. You'll smile and say, I sure made some wrong turns in my life, but it all worked for the best. You are big enough to laugh at yourself. You refuse to take yourself too seriously. So uh, that's an important aspect is to be able to laugh at ourselves and say, uh, yes, I made a mistake or I failed and uh, I'm on my way. I'll, I'll go again and it's not the last time I'm going to fail. After all, without your failures, you'd probably be a lot more arrogant than you already are. Now you're, you're good company. One thing about those mistakes and those failures, it, it does humble us. And uh, that's good. You know, um, you know, the fighter who always wins in a boxing match and then finally has a loss, sometimes he has more problems than the guy who has more of a spotted record because he's been able to persevere through the times he lost. The good news is you learned. You learned for yourself, and now you can help others. So certainly through my mistakes, uh, I've been able to help many other people. It's like my father said, son, I have a lot of good advice to give you, not because I've been so smart, just that I've been so stupid. So I always tell people part of my credential for helping you is my own stupidity. A lot of stupid things I've done, but I've learned from that, and I'm able to help my family, help my children, friends, patients, whomever, through those mistakes. And other people will trust what I have to say more because they know it was born of real-life experience. And you can help others without making them feel stupid or making them feel abnormal because you made the same mistakes. You were in their shoes. That's why you are the best teacher for them. You don't have to have been a drug addict to then become a drug counselor, but people who have drug addiction problems trust people who have had an issue in their lives. They just have more trust in them. They feel, well, you know what I'm going through. So this, uh, that's one of the hidden benefits. I wouldn't call it a hidden power, but a hidden benefit of failure is that you become more humble and you become better able to teach certain lessons in life to those around you. Now, another important aspect uh, in terms of not making mistakes is one mistake that you don't want to keep repeating. I mean, a lot of mistakes you can get away with repeating a number of times. One mistake you don't want to continue to make, and that is the mistake of not keeping your word. It's not a good mistake to keep repeating. Because if you become a person who doesn't keep his word, after a while nobody believes you when you give your word. So you say something and all they know about you is you said you're going to do it or you said you're not going to do it. So that's a, a key one. And what happens, the worst disaster of not keeping your word is after a while you don't believe yourself. So the word, which can create direction, meaning, and reality itself, the power of the word becomes lost to you. The disaster is it becomes lost to yourself and not only to other people. So for people who have that issue, and by the way, many people with substance abuse issues or underachievers have that problem of not keeping their word. It's a fairly common problem. And a, good, a great power thought there uh, is keeping my word is my first priority. Keeping my word is my first priority. If you have some exercise, you can take weights. Right now I'm just doing some shoulder rotations. Keeping my word is my first priority. I'm closing my eyes. I'm focusing on it. Keeping my word is my first priority. Keep my word as my first priority always. I had an amplifier. Keep my word as my first priority always. Keeping my word is definitely my first priority always. Keep my word as my first priority always. So I was closing my eyes, getting some proprioceptive involvement through uh, working my shoulders and repeating the, the power thought. Now, the power thought to be maximally effective should be repeated every five minutes the first day and twice an hour thereafter. So that's a mistake. If, if you have that issue, uh, because that will undermine success in all areas. If you don't keep your word, then the idea of failure motivating and, 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 and educating is not going to happen because you won't be able to implement it. If you don't keep your word, you will not be able to implement the hidden power of failure. So that's the one failure you don't want to keep repeating. I'm going to give a, a poem that's related to this. Feel the yearning. Arise in mutiny against love suppressed and dare believe in destiny. Shout, we have the right to be. Evolution, revolution, feel the burning. Do not fear to taste the tears of struggle and hardship years. Look into the essence of your father and be grateful you know him still. Find your courage, lift the mountain of your chains. Do not shudder in the dark. 
dash into the shadows that you feared. We are not sheep. Arise in mutiny against love suppressed and there believe in destiny. For we are not yet in our graves. Shout, we are human. And laugh in the shadow that you feared. Feel the burning. We are not asleep. We can truly love. Awaken to yourself and what you truly seek. Look into the eyes of one another and be grateful. Before this life does end, arise to the greatness of your yearning. Your courage is life's meaning. Do not fear to taste the tears of struggle and hardship years. In the wind we die, in our death we dance. And in our eyes there is a sign that we are on the mountain still. For beneath the fears and beneath the tears, and for all to see free and wild, there is a light, a glowing and knowing smile. Beneath the tears of the free and wild, a warm and loving smile. I thank everybody. Again, I'm very grateful to have had this time with you, those in the room, those watching the DVD, those listening to the CD. Uh, you motivate me, you inspire me to present this, and you help give meaning to my life. Thank you.